hey, it's Hellbent. No, wait a minute. I'm not Hellbent. I'm Joe from The Automator. And, and Hellbent is on the call here with me here. And uh, we, we, man, how long ago did we start talking uh, today? Like an hour and a half, two hours ago? I don't know. I think so, two hours ago. Yeah, and uh, we just kind of kept going and going. You know, he's working on uh, adding some really cool functionality to the Windows snipping tool. And uh, anyway, he he was like, "Hey, I have this other tool. Maybe you'd be interested in it." And I said, "This is stupid. Why don't we record some of this so we can share it with everybody?" Because I know you, everyone watching these would love to see stuff. They love when you're on my channel, man. So, and and I hear people saying they they want to see more from you. So hopefully, at some point, you get back into it. Yeah. yeah well, okay. Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, so, so what I'm going to show you today is uh, a simple class that I've created for working with layered windows. So if you're not familiar with layered windows, it's just basically a window that you don't see anything unless you draw something to it. Hmm. So normally when you create a GUI, you can say, uh, show me a GUI of this size. And then it shows you this bordered white background thing, right? Yeah. If you do the same thing with a layered window, you see nothing. Okay. It's a layer. It's just, but it's, yeah, I get it. So I don't, I don't know all the, the, the technical specs, specs of what it is specifically, right. but for the layman, for us, we can just think of it as, unless we draw something to this window, we're not going to see anything. It's glass. Window. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yep. Um, so this, what this does is allows you to get something up on your screen. Like if you're, if you're not familiar with working with uh, GDIP in general, there's a huge amount of setup. Like it can take you an hour of coding to, before you even get something going. So this allows you to prototype really quickly. And if you're doing simple things where you just want, uh, uh, let's say an image with transparency somewhere on your screen, this can do it in just a couple of lines of code. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but for the most part, you're creating a, a non-coding way to, to write your code. Right. So it's it's a class that wraps up a bunch of code together. So you can call up just a couple of functions and it reduces the amount of code that you would have to type out by, let's say. Oh, I'm sorry. OK. All right. So that's what the class does. It, 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 it deals with setting up a layered window, all the steps that you would need to start drawing on a layered window. It does all that setup for you. And then it has a couple of functions that inside of a class, they're called methods, but it's just a function. They're tied to the, the class, but it's just a function. So it has a bunch of functions that you can call up to do different tasks. So you can create a new window with one function. You can destroy the window with another function. You can add a picture with one function. You can paint the background with another function. So we're going to go through a couple of the functions and using the class, and you'll see that it's, it's really easy. So the first thing you need is a copy of the GDI plus library by tick. So I don't know if you get a version that's like more modern. So my version is like, I got the last time I picked up a copy was 2016 or 17 or maybe 18. So I don't know if you get a brand new copy of somebody else's version of the library, if they've changed some of the functions to not work anymore. I don't think anyone would do that. I think they would just add more functions to their library. But to be safe, if you get the library by tick and you can find it on the AutoHotKey forum, that's the one that we're using. So you just need to include that. You can either include it at the top of your script like this by typing out include and then the path to it. Or, you know, just type the path to it because the way I do it is, this is the only way I know to do it. So I, in my documents file, if I go to my, uh, my uh, file folder, and if I go to documents, there's a, there is a folder called auto hotkey. And if I go inside of no, that's auto, auto hotkey, there's a folder called LIB. And then inside of here is where I have that library. So somehow, how? Somehow by me typing out the, the name of the library in here between these, it does it. You showed me that there's another way to do it where you don't even have to type out include. My suggestion to people is if you don't know what you're doing, just type out the full path. Just type out the full path. So it'll be percent agree. whatever drive it's on. It's C, right? For me, I know that this works for me, so I'm going to do it this way. I, 
I just looked, and the one by Tick was last updated in 2014. So um, he hasn't updated his at all. And um, for the class itself, do you, I'm going to give you a copy of it that you can post a link to, or you have a copy of it, right? So yeah. you'll be able to post a link to yeah, the, the, the pop-up window. Yeah. Okay, so he's going to post a link to it, but the class itself looks like this. So this is, he'll give you all of this stuff here. Um, and we'll go, we'll go through everything as we go through it, but it's about 170 lines, give or take. Most of it's the helper function. So I'm going to go ahead and include that as well. You can just paste it into your script. Well, and that's why I was, before we get into the actual coding of it, what I want to tell people, if you're not used to programming with classes and this kind of scares you, using classes is far easier than it is to actually write a class. So don't let the phrase class scare you. Yes, yes. And for me, it's, it's more of just like, the, the idea of the class is I have these functions. They're all related to each other. So for organization, I want them all connected. I want them to be able to share the same information and mm -hmm. everything like that. And, and classes just makes that a little bit easier. You don't have to pass things around. It knows what it is. Um, so the name of the class, whatever you, whatever you name your file, that's what you're putting in here. And I'm a slow typer, so bear with me. Okay, so now I have included the libraries that I need. The next step is to activate the GDIP library. So GDIP startup. Now what you can do is this return this function here returns the pointer to a token. So you can save that. So P token colon equals that. But because more, when you shut down your script, now this is my understanding. So, so if somebody, if I'm wrong about this, somebody should point this out. If I shut down my script without turning that off, it's going to do it for me. I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, auto so hotkey does its own cleanup. That's my understanding. It's well. free, yeah. So the unless point you launch, like if you're using automating Excel and you actually launch Excel, you know, Excel stays launched. And perhaps some environmental variables. Fair enough. Contain, Maybe too. Yeah. But other than that, um, you, there's no need like the, our whole program, our program is using GDIP from start to finish. So it doesn't, we don't need to shut it down. Right. If our, if our program was doing like once in a blue moon, like it's constantly running day after day after day, right. and we only need to use GDIP for a second, then start it up. You do what you need to do, then shut it down. But we don't need to shut it down. <clears throat> um, Exit out of my auto execute area, and I have a I have a procedure that I always go through. It's just to make sure that I, everything's always consistent. No. Yeah. Right. So that's I, for that, my friend. So I have I have my I always have my setup and then my exit routine. My exit routine gets put in right away. These are just uh, what I use for testing. As soon as I have a more developed app, then I change it to whatever I want. Okay. So, so this. Go ahead. I was just saying you should throw all that into a hot string for you. So you hit a button yeah. and, and it's all, if it's yeah. like every time, right? It's, I, anyway. it, I've tried. It's, I just can't get into hot string. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I'm going to do. Okay. So now that I have the script saved, um, the tool, the class itself has a built-in tool. So while we're writing our program, we can use this tool to clipboard the, the methods and we can actually see them what they are. In order to do that, um, the best way to do it is in our script here, we can just type out a hotkey that we can use. So I'll do numpad three is what I usually do. And then we can call um, pop up window dot helper. Okay, pop up window helper. And now, if I run the script again, oh, I forgot. I think it wasn't for 
up at the top, up at the top of the script, I usually add in my other options. So uh, single instance force, setbacks lines to negative one. It's in my default as well. And no environment. Okay, so that's that's all my setup. So now if I run this again and hit number pad three, I should get this. Cool. Right? <clears throat> now I want to create a, let's say I want to, let's say I have a PNG image that I want to get up on my screen. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new window. I'm going to give it whatever name. Paste it in. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show the window. Sorry. Number um, sorry, I, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding this. So you hit the new window, you, you possibly change the name of the GUI one by doing something. Does it automatically... I'm going to come back to this stuff in a minute. I'm going to come back to this stuff in a minute. So I'm going to skip the things that I know that I need. But still, my question is, when did it get shoved into the clipboard? As soon as I clicked on the button. Okay, thank you. All right. And there is, I don't know if you can hear it, but there is. there should be two beats. No, I don't. Okay, so there's two beeps when you click on it that conf confirms that it's in your clipboard. Okay. So beep, beep, and then paste. Um, there's, so this, like I said, this window is invisible, so you don't see anything. So showing it doesn't show anything. Sure. Right? But it needs to be shown eventually in order to see it. So I just show it. Now I know that the window is there, even though I can't see anything. What I, I can do this, I can do this last or I can do it first. It doesn't matter. The, but here, let's do it last. So just before. So now what I want to do is I want to make sure that this window is working. So the best way to do that is just paint the background. So now I've, I've created a new window. I'm going to go through and edit everything. So I've created a new window. I painted the background. In order for you to see anything, you have to update the window. So showing the window isn't what makes you see it. Updating the window is what makes you see it. So I'm going to update the window. And then if I do this, I should now see. If I run this right now, what I should see is a window, little window that's centered in my screen, 100 pixels by 100 pixels, that has a black background. And that's it. So... I've created GUI one is now a, a GUI named window one. So let's say this was actually my settings window. I would name it settings. So this is the name of the window. If you're familiar with coding out GUIs, you know that you can type out like a GUI, my GUI, new, and then your options. So this, this thing here is the name, and that's this, window one, right? So if I wanted my GUI to be named my GUI, now it's called my GUI. If I want to do men, you can manually still interact with this GUI the way you would a normal GUI. So as long as you know which name you gave it, then you can do the same things that you normally would be able to do, like a GUI um, one color. Actually, this wouldn't work because it's a layered window, but uh, let's see, a GUI one hide. So this would work. All of these commands would still work like normal. Well, wait, your window name up there is my GUI. Is that still going to work or is it? No, nope, sorry. I meant to go back. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah. Just making sure I was understanding how this was getting done. Yeah. So it's whatever I name, name this here, it's just basically what I would normally do with yep. here. And lines 11 through 13 are refer, well, 10 through 13 are using GUI, the word GUI one at the beginning, but that's referring to your class. So that's not. That's, you, that's, that's my instance of the class. Okay. Thank you. All right. So you can create, you can create as many windows as you want, right? And then this is the object that has it. So in this, if I look at this object, if I look at, let's say, um, GUI1.hwnd. So this is the handle for that window. Um, wait, no, GUI1. That's the handle for the window. 
if I want the width for the window, if I want the X position for the window, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it, as soon as I create it, it returns an object with various properties of with these, with these keys here, with these properties here, and you can go, what I suggest you to do is go into this and change any options that you don't want. So like, so for example, the, the options that it starts with, if you don't fill in any window options, it'll use these, or the X position, if you don't fill them in or whatever, you can change the defaults um, for those. The rest of them is this part here is, sets up the GDIP stuff. So this gets the this creates the GUI, which is right here. So this is basically that line I put up the top where this window name was my GUI. All right, and then new and then options. These are the options. Okay. This specific option is what makes a layered window. Yeah. Wow. Right, and then that's it. So it's this. This class, all it does is it makes typing this stuff out easy because you don't because you would have to do this stuff every single time. So this you just you know, want and it's in there. Okay, so so like I said, this is my object, and anytime I want to act on that window, I can just use that plus the method. So if I want to this and this is going to be three two. Oh, my internet connection is unstable. Can you see me? I hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's gone. It's gone. I had the little message on my screen saying it was unstable. Yeah, you're you're cutting in and out every once in a while, but it's not too terrible. Maybe change that color. Let me know if I need to repeat myself anytime. Okay, yeah. so now I've created a second. Right? I'll go through the color. I'll go through the color, how the color works. So that's two windows. Okay, so that's the basics of doing that. Um, what I can also do, I'll go over a couple of the features that. You can do in Windows 8 more as we go, but I'll show one right now. If you have Windows 8 or higher, what you can actually do is use this a second window as a child. So I can say um, plus parent one, and now whatever coordinates I use here are relative to the in the the client area of this. So if I say put this at 10 and 10, it will be 10 pixels over and 10 pixels down to start in the second in the parent window. So I should see a black strip and then a red square inside. And there. Right? So now these so this option doesn't work for Windows 7 or earlier well. So this would crash the script, which makes things suck. So if you want <laughs> yeah. if you the only option that if you want to do this kind of thing, have layers in Windows 7 is the best, your best bet is just to do owner, the owner name, and then every time you move the window around, get its new position and move things with it. So if you have to have two layers at once and you want to move things around, you got to, as soon as it's done moving, you got to calculate its new position and draw it at its new position. I'm with you. But but with the parent approach, you don't have to. It'll move them together. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay, so let's. We started out as saying that this is a, a way of getting an image on the screen real quick. So how do I do that? So as long as I have the script running, I can get my tool, and then I'm going to go draw a bitmap. And up here, I'm going to replace this. Actually, I'll keep it there for now, just so that way I can debug. And I'm going to draw a bitmap. Now, I can do, if I want to, I can take an image from my file. So I can take an image that's somewhere on my computer. So this this tool here, it's available somewhere on the forum. It's called uh, GDIP functions tool, you can, if you really want it. All it is is just a list of the GDIP functions. 
so I can search them a little bit easier. Um, and I'm looking for bitmap from file. I didn't know how to do a filter when I created this. In other words, I would be able to filter out what I'm looking for. It's not the best tool, but it's... Uh, Okay, so there's this function here. I have to make sure I include, I do this after I start up GDIP. So no, no using GDIP before that. Um, and I can say that so I'm going to get the bitmap from an image file and simplicity to do. Okay, so I have a I have I now have the pointer to a bitmap and now I'm going to draw that bitmap in here. So that's my variable p bitmap that contains the pointer to my bitmap. I'm going to put that in this first argument here for a draw uh, GUI one draw bitmap. And then where where in the window do I want to position it? So these are relative to the client area of the window. So if if I only want to put this one image in it, then I would just specify zero zero. Um, to get because I'm getting an image from a file, I don't know how big this image is. So there's a couple of functions in GDIP that I can just get the size of it. I was already writing code earlier, so I'll just borrow that code to get it. Um, let's see. Um, which one was that? Here. So rather than me going into that tool and looking up these two functions, I'll just grab them from there. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. And then you put the paths. Yeah. What one I haven't uh, recorded the video yet, but I was playing with it. It's a script from Scan called File X Pro. And it's amazing the amount of uh, attributes that are available on a given file. And so I was playing with it anyway. It, it, maybe next week I'll release a video on it. It should be pretty awesome. But it, the point being, I think it has like image height and width and stuff. Uh, and, you know, and it's built into Windows, so it's just nice to have. Yeah. Um, for me, I don't usually, there's probably even, I, I've seen a couple of functions that seem that they should be able to do the width and height all at one in one function call. Mm -hmm. I tried it earlier yesterday, I think it was, but uh, the first one I called, it didn't work for some reason. So I was like, you know what? I'm just, I know that this other way works. So I just. And to your point, I mean, if you're already using the GDI library, right, then, hey, why not? No, it was actually, it was actually two, two other functions in the GDIP library. Like one of them was like get image dimensions and. Oh. And dimensions oh i'm so sorry was, but yeah so one was like gdip get image dimensions and then the other one was uh gdip get dimensions uh -huh. i tried one i tried one of them i don't remember which one it was yeah. but for some reason it didn't return the width and height so i was like well i know these other ones work so yep i just want to make progress so i just went so yeah so now i have a width and a height of that image that i just got the create bitmap from file and I'm going to use that as the width and height of my window because I only want to display just that window, um, just that image. Um, width and height. So I'm going to center my window on the width, the X and Y axis, and I'm going to give my width and height. And the bitmap that I'm drawing is the same size as my window. So width and height. Now I have the choice of... Am I going to, do I need to draw this image over and over again? 
if I need to draw this image over and over again, I don't want to dispose it. I want to keep it in memory so I don't have to keep loading it up anymore. So I'll hit, I'll put this pose to zero so it'll save the bitmap. But if I'm using like, I, what I do is often dynamic graphics. So I'll have to recreate the bitmap several times throughout the course of a script run. So in that case, as soon as I've created it, used it, I can dispose it. So that way the next time that memory is created, I don't have to worry about uh, having 10 gigabytes worth of, uh, of data used. <laughs> But let's say in this case, I want to use that, maybe you want to use that image later. So I'll say, I don't want to get rid of the image. So I can call, so P bitmap still has a value for later. And now I, I should be able to get rid of this paint background. So I have create a new window, draw a bitmap to it, update the window, and then show the window. And there's my, my thing. Oh, I was so confused there for a second. I'm like, how did you make all those buttons? No, that's yeah. the image. Yeah. <laughs> well, here. So this here. Actually, this that tool there was created with layered windows. So that's the kind of thing that you can do with, with layered windows, right? So here's another image. Um, okay, so what should we look at next? Um, questions so far? No, this is pretty interesting. Yeah. Right. So, so this is. The I'm just curious, uh, um, because I I know what you do well enough to know, creating the images is cool and all, but at some point you you want to be able to detect that someone often clicks it, right, or does yes. something. Yeah. So, I don't know if you were planning to. to so, yeah. So, so that's that was where I was going to go next. Okay, um, cool. So, let's say let's say for example, I just want to. Um, Move the window. Move. Let's, let's just move the window. So, the simplest way to do this for everyone is just to use messages. So, I don't know how familiar people with messages, but basically, every single time you like move your mouse over a, a window or click on it or right click it or Easy. anything like that, yeah. Windows messages just start pa getting passed back and forth, and it tells it what to do yeah. at yeah. that for, for that message. Yes. So, one of the messages we can look at is if we click on our GUI. And the way we do that is we type out on message. And then inside of, it's a function. So we need to, now we give it the message that we're going to be looking for. Uh, you want to use the hex decimal thing for it. Let me actually pull up something. Um, I'm not very good at messages. I don't, I only know a few of them. Uh, yeah, I, I don't work with them. I should, you know, and I was talking, I think, to Tank about it and a lot of the stuff with auto hockey commands are, you know, really um, wrapping, sending messages. Yeah. If I understand it correctly. Um, but yeah. So I, if, if you actually understand and learn messages, then you can skip a lot of other stuff and have much more control over what you're doing. Yeah. And I, anyone that's like interested, I, I recommend it. It's, but it is, it is a bit of a rabbit hole. It is a bit of a rabbit hole. So <laughs> no doubt. So, so anyways, this, if you type, I found this by going, I always find this by going to Google and typing in AHK list of Windows messages. No. And uh, Raptor X you know, on YouTube, he has a, a very good, I think it's really three videos on sending messages, but it's a really good tutorial. It's a good, introdu that's a good introductory, but yeah. I don't know, I don't know how much people from that video will be able to instantly go out and start coding. Oh, sure. Yeah. That's like, that's like, that's your tiptoe into that rabbit hole. He yeah. gives you a good way to get into the rabbit. It's a start, yeah. yeah. So this is a list of messages. Um, some of the names, they, they seem to do one thing. They say that you think that they do something, yeah. but they don't. I don't know. But uh, the ones we're looking for are right in here, right in here. So we're going to be using left mouse button down. So this message here is if I click on the GUI, and then I can also monitor if I click up, but we just need to click down, which is zero X is do, 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 here. It's zero X two Oh one. You can put, you can put an extra zero there. That's technically what it is, but you don't need to. I know we do. Um, and then pass it to a function, give it a function name. Um, let's see. 
I'll just call it on click. There's a technique. So most the, the convention normally. OK, so this is the convention that I've seen normally. The convention normally is that the name of the function would be this. That would be what pe most people would put as the name of the function. I don't I don't like that convention. That doesn't really mean anything to me. So I so on this this means more to me. Yeah, what or of course you could you could actually do both, right? Put the the first thing on it and then put the on click on it and you're covered. Yeah, yeah. And also another thing that people often do is if they're using multiple messages, they'll put them in all in the same function. So they the name will be message handler or something like that. So okay. instead of on click, it'll be message handler. Yeah, I gotcha. You can find like multiple messages to go to the same place and then parse out the messages from there. Hmm. Uh, like, so this, whenever this function gets called, it has four, four parameters that automatically get passed to it. I'm not very familiar with using them. So I, I typically, it's, I typically don't yet unless I have to. Yeah. Because I, I don't have them memorized, so I have to go and dig them up. Oh, trust me. Yeah. I, and I don't really know what I'm looking for, so I no. don't really get this. So, yeah. So I'll show you. I'll show you. I'll explain that you can. There's better ways that I'm going to be doing it than I'm way I'm going to be doing it. But the way I'm going to be doing it works. And if you just want to get going, it'll work. It'll do. You can do it this way. So. I don't remember if it's L parameter first or W parameter first, but let's just type them out anyways. So there's like that, then mess message, and then page. So there's these are the parameters that get passed to it automatically. There's something called the W param. There's something called an L param. Uh, then there's the message. So what message was the thing that triggered this function? So like I said, you can have I can do 202, and I can now parse by looking at the message that called up the function to see which one it was. Was it two? Sorry, we got a little. I, I had a phone call that I had to um, deal with, so go ahead. Hold yeah. So Jeez. hit the wrong. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I, I I've lost track. Tiny bit. We were talking about like we can combine the two to go to the same message. I think so. Yeah. Um, like this is a, this is a common thing that will, people will do is if they'll have multiple messages go to the same function and then they can just parse it inside of it by looking at what the value of messages. Like I said, I don't deal with a lot of this stuff. I haven't played around with it. Every time I do, I need to spend let's say an hour to do something that I could have other methods that I can do in three minutes. So usually I'll take the easy road, you know? Uh, so I just wanna make it sure that everyone knows that there's better ways that these parameters that it's passing, they have information that you can use to do the kinds of things that I'm gonna be doing without using them. But they're more specific, they're better. They're... So what I'm gonna do is I have this window and I want to be able to move it. So I've said, okay, I want to monitor the, me the message clicks. I want to monitor every single time I click on one of the GUIs that my script creates. So inside of here, I only have one GUI, but let's say that I maybe have a couple of GUIs. Maybe I have a couple of GUIs. So let's first of all, check out what that, that handle, I'll, I'll use the handle. Um, let's see what that has. So I'm going to check out what this guy has and see if I can use that to uh, match with my window. But I don't think that I can. I don't, I'm not sure if I can. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this. I'll show you the better way. So instead of calling up directly to the function, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bind my window object to it. So that way I don't have to make my window object global. So to do that, I'm going to do um, um, func, and then the name of the function is on click, and then I'm going to do dot bind, and then this is the, what I want to pass to it automatically. So I'm going to pass it 
um, the GUI one object. So this contains all my positions and everything else. Uh, and in here, I think I don't think I need to do anything special. I think I can just do GUI one dot. We'll find out. So if I click now, if I click now, it's going to cause this to get called up. And it has that, so maybe, maybe I need to add in here. See, I'm used to doing this in classes. In classes, I can, this is, is invisible, like it's, it's there without you having to specify. Um, so what it might be is that I need to put that thing that I passed to it as the first thing. So which was GUI one. Worst case scenario, I'll just put it global. Okay, there we go. That's so. This is the part that I don't like. It's one of them's giving me the integer number, and the other one's giving me the hexadecimal number. And I hate doing the conversion, but let's see if sometimes if statements if statements converts it to numbers. So we sh might be able to use that. So I'm going to say if handle equals Of this one. So I've just set it up so that way, if the thing that it's getting for the value for HWND matches the handle for our window, then it's going to give me a tooltip. In other words, it's not. Okay, so there, we, we can use the handle. If I didn't want to use this variable handle, now if what would mess me up is if I had a bunch of controls. If this thing had a bunch of controls in it, then that handle might be that control. So that would mess me up. So where I would, this is where I would normally do what I would normally do, which would be um, mouse get position. And then I don't need an X, I don't need a Y. What I do need is a variable for the window and that's it. So this now will give me the handle to the window that, I'm, that I clicked on. So I can replace handle from there with win. And I should get the same result. So this is how I would normally do it. I would just normally use mouse get position. But like I said, there's better, more stronger tools available. Um, now that I know that it's working, uh, what do I want it to do? I want it to move the window. So to do that, I can just do post message. There's on message, there's post message, and send message. I'm not the right person to discuss what the differences are, but let's just say, let's, so there's, there's a subtle difference between post message and send message. Yeah. But let's say, let's just say that both of them have to do what? with, instead of receiving a message, it's sending a message. What, what doesn't one of them actually wait for a return? Yeah. So which one? I don't remember which one. Uh, maybe I don't remember. I, I would think I would think I would think it send message waits for the return. Yeah, but I, right. Got to think about it like old times as mailing. It's in the post, like yeah. it's you know being posted. And this, I think you're right, but I could be wrong too. Yeah, I could be wrong as well. So, but anyways, this one is a post message, and it's the messages. It's one of the only ones that I have memorized. I've had it. It's like I've had this memorized for six years now. It's zero x a one and then comma and two. And by doing this, when it encounters this, whatever window's currently active, hit it with the the command to allow me to drag it and move it. So that's all this does. So now when I click, when I click on this, it's going to post the message that says that. I should be able to move the window around. And there we go. If I want to have, if I want to have multiple functions in this where I don't want to just be able to click it everywhere and drag it around, what I would need to do is find out where my mouse is. Let's do it. So in one of these, in one of these guys here, you can break it down and get the, the position of the cursor. I don't have it memorized, so I can't do it here. It would take me 10 minutes to look up the code for it. So let me show you how I would do it. I would just put an X 
and a Y in there. And I would make sure I know what my screen mode is or my, my chord mode is. So there's three different chord modes. There's relative to the screen, relative to the window, and relative to the client area. What I'm going to do is because this, because this message here is only triggered by me clicking on it, I know that the window that I'm going to be using is going to be active. So I can use client as my best result. Right. Um, if I was just if this was the, the 200 message where I just move my mouse over it, then I would need to consider more carefully. What do I want to use? Do I want to use the client, the window or the screen to get my coordinates? But because I'm clicking on the window, I know it's active. So any client area I get, I know it's for this window. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to say instead of I'm going to say I'm going to add another condition. So normally I would just do and my next condition, but to maybe make it a little bit easier for people to read, I'll say if it has to go through this extra bit of logic to get to the post message. So now I'll say, I only want that if I click the first 20 pixels from the top. So I'll say if um, y is less than 20. So if, if it's my GUI that I clicked on and where I clicked is less than 20 pixels from the top, so Y equals zero up here, Y equals five, Y equals 10, Y equals 20, whatever. So if I click here, nothing happens. If I click here, I can move the window. And now what I can do is use these spaces for other controls. Very cool. Let's say I want to use this red as a button to pop up a message box. I can create a, a position. So I'll just say, I'll just call it button. I'll create an object called button. Just because of my simple mind. Um, and I'm going to give it an X position, Y position. So if you're not familiar, anyone's not familiar with the syntax, this is an associative array. So it's uh, this, it works on key value pairs. So I look at a variable, I look at an object and it's key or associative array's key, and that gives me a value. So it has an X key and then I will have a value of whatever position I want to draw it, a Y key that'll have the Y value. Um, button X. So I'm just going to, I'm going to guess where this is. So that looks about X 20, Y 30, width of about 200, height of about 30. And now I'll come in here and I'll say um, else if now I go through, I use these coordinates here and I might try to match them to be within this space here. So I'll say, um, in order to get this to go into the function without making it global, what I'm going to do is do GUI one dot button. So now it's attached to that GUI one object. Yes, you can do that. You can make as many, you can add to that GUI one object as many things as you want. Whatever. I need to know what Bob's name is, then I can store it in that and I can look at it anytime I want. You're not restricted on the keys that it can hold. Yeah, I get you. Uh, you got me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so in this case, I could, if I want to have like a list of controls where I have all these positions, then it's easy enough just to add them to the GUI one object and now they'll get passed into my function with me. So I'll say if um, X is greater than um, GUI one dot button, or is it buttons or buttons? Button, button dot X. So if I clicked past this line in this direction, so if I clicked over here somewhere, and if X is less than 
really one dot x plus GUI one dot width. Does that make sense? So if my mouse is past here and less than here. You follow? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, so, and then, and if y is greater than three, one dot y, no problems. I think that's it. So all I've said is if I click somewhere between here and here and between here and here, if I click somewhere in there, this should be a true statement. And there we go. So this is how I can go about adding in some controls. And if I want that, maybe I'd call up a function or a label. Click on that button and it's in test. Maybe I don't want it to do that. Maybe I want it to uncalculate it. So that's the basics of setting up uh, uh, your window so that way you can have different areas that you can click in to do different things, move your window around. Uh, now let's go into some, uh, any questions about that? No, but um, it was reminding me a lifetime ago, a long, long time ago, before I was talking to Jackie H. Stuck, um, I had stumbled onto his website of how to create a beautiful GUI, I think was the name of the post. And he, he kind of had a, it was a simpler approach, but you, it only allowed you to do um, two or three, you know, toggles. So it wasn't as robust as this. But um, I, I see the total value of compared to using the older style auto hotkey, you know, GUI buttons, uh, laying out like a hot area that you can then just click in that coordinates and do what you want. It's super powerful, right? Really cool. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's for Windows. This is what we have to do for Windows Seven and earlier. Windows Eight and above, we don't need this coordinate system. Because we can, what we can do is we can actually detect, even I, like I said, layered windows, you can't see anything on them. It's only if you draw something to them. But I, the caveat is it, I can embed normal GUI controls and actually interact with those GUI controls, even though I can't see them. So rather than me setting up a bunch of buttons for all of these guys here, all I'd have to do is just put a text control in that spot. And there's no need to monitor messages. It just, I can just say, go to this label when you get clicked and it goes to that label. Wow. Cool. Very cool. I get it. Yeah.
So let's let me show you let me show you an example of that for Windows. This is for Windows 8 and above. So if you if if anyone who's watching, if you're writing a script and you're not sure whether somebody's going to be using Windows 8 or not, don't do this. It's, hey, because nope. you, can't, you can't run this script. Yeah. Do me a favor though. L let's create a different script and that way we we'll okay. this one so we can share it with people as a you know so, okay. sure. so I'll just copy this and start the first one. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So let's get rid of this message. So the message they work this. Let let me do one more. Let me do uh, uh, on move. There's some some cool things I want to show with this moving thing, but I want to get I want to get with like what people are mostly going to be using. It's like their own images or whatever. Um, Two hundred. So I've set up, this is the message for, it, it'll detect if my cursor moves in the GUI. So I can test that um, with a tool tip. I always recommend uh, anytime you're coding, just write a tool tip. All right, so here, if I move in the window, it does my thing. Um, Yeah, I'll come back. Like I said, I'll come back to this uh, after because we can do dynamic things with this now. Like if I want these these to animate, for example, to tell me that they're they have something over them. So we'll get rid of these messages and we'll go, we'll look at the the Windows 8 version now. Um, for the Windows 8 version, I just need to know my coordinates. So what I do. I have this bitmap, this thing I call a bitmap maker. And when I design something, it gives me everything that I draw on it. So let's say this, this little rounded rectangle here. That has a corresponding line in here. And what I'll often do is I'll put notes on it. So that way, when I get the code afterwards, I can just grab these coordinates. So it'll have a note that says, okay, this is, let's say this was a mock edit control. I just draw an outline that I want to be the graphics for a mock edit control. I'll say edit one or something like that. And now when it updates, it has a note. When I export the code, there'll be a comment right below the, right before the line that has these coordinates on it. And I can go through it and find these little notes, grab those coordinates and what we talked about before, we had it, we talked about briefly about that in our, one of our other meeting, but what I could also do is I could say edit one and then, uh, X3, Y31. And then as soon as I have my code, I can just go and copy this. The point is I need, I want this because that's what this would be. This would be that. And I would have those coordinates for that. And then I can just go GUI. The name of the GUI I'm using, this is GUI1, add, text. Um, now I have those positions that I, I had. So um, let's, I'm just going to make it up. So I'm going to assume that's about 20 pixels. So X20, Y30, width 200, height 30. And I'll say, go to test. So I have this test. And now the same thing. I don't have the move anymore. I don't have the, so I, that would actually be the first thing I do. I would add in, you know what, let's do that. Let's do that. It's a lot easier to do debugging when I can move the window or testing when I can move the window. Um, here, I already know the width. Use the variable width because we got the width of the image, which is also the width of our window, which is also going to be the width that we can drag the window. So now we can move the window. And it's just that post message thing.
So now I have two embedded controls in this. One, if I click on one of them, it allows me to move the window. And the other one, if I click on it, it launches the calculator. So this is Windows 8. There's no, no monitoring messages. I don't need to look for coordinates or anything like that. In fact, when I go, if I want to, let's say, animate this, so that way, these, let's say that I want these buttons to change color when I go over them. Yeah. When I use that, that, that on message, um, the, two, the 200, inside of it, Now, like I said, there, those, there is those parameters that you can use to do this exact thing, but I don't have those memorized, so. What am I looking for? Two, three. So this, this I'm using the fourth parameter in the mouse get position, which gives me the output bar control. Um, and I don't remember, I think if I just leave it like this, it'll give me the, the class MN of the control. So let's say if it's an edit control, it'll be edit one, edit two, edit three, or button, button one, button two, button three. But that's not what I want. I want to get the handle for the control. And so that's option two. So now if I go, I can go um, in here. Uh, let's say I put, so I'm going to get the, I'm going to store the handle to this control. And um, there's the whole global scope and everything like that that you have to worry about. But I don't want to I don't want to spend a lot of time on setting up a structure, so I'm just going to make it global. I'm going to take that variable and I'm going to make it global, so I don't have to bind it again. But remember that first thing that we did with where I bought, I bound the, the the GUI one object to our messages. Yeah. Ideally, I would want to do something like that again, rather than making um, this global. So now we can get access to our handle. Um, in here, I can say, if, how you write your logic is up to you. Like, I'm, I'm writing my logic based on the example that I'm doing. Uh, so what do I want? I want to see if CTRL equals, um, what do I call it, button H1? Now, if I if my I've set up so that way the control for my move window, if I detect that, so if I had some kind of animation sequence, now that I've detected that, I know that that I'm hovering over that, I can change the animation for it a little bit. So this is Windows 8. I can do the same thing. I can have everything, all of these things wrapped up into arrays. So what what I often do is I'll create uh, somebody, I don't, I think it was Nick on the form that showed me this first, um, or at least a, a, my interpretation of it. So I'll usually, I'll usually create two arrays or objects. One, one is, I call handles, and I use the handle of the control as its position in the, the array. So the handle to a control is a number. So I, I say, okay, take this array and at index handle, put a value there, right? And then likewise, I'll do another one called controls. This can be an array or it can be an object. It depends on my mood that day. I'll do it as this. So what I'll say now is now that I have, I can get rid of this button HWMD. I don't need that anymore. I don't need that. Instead, I'm just going to use a generic HWND because I'm going to, I can overwrite this variable over and over and over again. I don't need to keep it around. 
because as soon as I get it, I'm going to store it somewhere else, and then I can use that variable again. So I'm going to say um, handles, and up here, maybe in a function or at the top of my script somewhere, I'm going to create a list of my controls. So I'll say controls. Um, For example, and now this can have an X position, maybe a Y position. It might have, if it's if it's some custom graphics thing, it might have colors associated with it. Anything that I want to have associated with that button, like for instance, uh, if I click on it, do I want to go? Do I want to have it go to a label so I can tell it which label I want to go to? So any information that I want about this. This uh, button, I can st I store it in an object, and then so I'll just do. Once I have my collection of objects, so however many button controls I want, I can put that into a loop to add those controls. Each time it adds a control, I take that array handles and I set that to be equal to whichever control I'm currently doing. So in the case of a loop, uh, this isn't probably, I might not want to do names like this because I'd have to have a, I'd have to create a list so that way it knows what order to go because a for loop goes through them alphabetically, not necessarily the order I want them to be going in. Um, and I'll just say, in this case, I'll say it's this. So what I've done here now is I've said that, and I can add, sorry, one last thing. Depends on what you're doing. This is helpful. You don't always need to do this. So now I have this array that if, if I hover, I can use it. If I'm hovering over something, it tells me what object has the data for that. So in, in here, rather than looping through all of my controls and seeing, trying to match which one matches the one that I have, right? So if I have 100 controls and I'm looking for 99, it has to loop through 99 times. Instead, what I can do is I can use that handles array to tell me automatically which control it is. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, it, it's it's so coincidental you, you said this because yesterday's webinar was on objects, right? And, and someone on the chat had said, hey, you know, is there a way to look for a certain value in an object, you know, like there is, has key, or is key, you know, with the object? And I said, no, I don't I don't believe so. I'm, I'm not the, you know, the pro on this, but I, I think you'd have to look over them. But I said, you could create a second object using the values as a key and then store the the values as the index in your original object, you know, to yeah. keep where it is. Um, and that's kind of what you're doing, right? You're creating an index that you can e know where it is and not have to loop across. So there's two, there's two ways that you could use this exact thing. So here I have it where the controls array or object, the controls object actually holds information. But what you can also do is the controls object or controls array and the handles array both point to another object. Okay, yeah. Right? So you can use both of those. You can use, an, let's say, an index. I can use a controls.index to point to a control, or I can use a control uh, handles.hwin to point to a control. So it's easy. It's whenever you're coding, you if you can get the handle to a control, you can find out which all of the data. And if you if you specifically know that I want to trigger my title bar, I know which num control number it is because I wrote the code. I can say, okay, trigger target that that um, specific object. And how you do that is so we have this control here. Rather than comparing, rather than me going through my list of controls that I might have, 
and comparing. Instead, I can just say um, handles. So now, basically, if there is something in the handles array at control position, then it's true. And the only time that's going to be ha that's going to happen is if I've assigned something. So if I take these global global, I think. I think I'm okay. Let's see. Okay, so here, button one. So I didn't need to loop through anything. If I had a million controls, it's automatically going to jump to, it's automatically going to know which one it is. And if I look, it should tell me, if I look at the value, it tells me uh, move window button. So that's the name of my my button that tell, tells me my control. So using the handle to do anything to manipulate that control might not be very useful. So in that case, what I'll do is I'll take my controls, controls object, and I'll use this as the key. And let's look at its uh, label. The label is test. So, any question about this? No, no. It's a, but it is a yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. So this I can use the handle of a control to point to the object that's associated with it. Yeah. yeah um, that's super powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's pretty much like I, I find myself using that technique more and more every day. Every time I write out a new script, it's it becomes more and more that. Well, I'm using. You know, you've you've been on some long calls with Maestrith with me, right? And mm -hmm. I see the stuff he does, and and to me, it's it's light years ahead of you know anywhere where I am. the The other day, I was on a call with him. Like I said, he's programming, I think, in C sharp now. And he's like, "Let me show you some of the stuff I've been working on." And he's like, "Yeah, I really rethought how I do stuff with dot notation, and this is really cool." And he started showing me all the stuff, and I'm like, "Well, wait a minute, you know." Everything you showed me here, like, as far as I can tell, I could do it on a hotkey, right? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, but now I'm actually really using objects and object and dot notation, you know, in a, in a much more, um, you know, advanced way. And it just kind of made me laugh because I'm like, he's, you know, he was already light years ahead of me. Yeah. Even for him, though, he still, like, there's, you know, again, it comes back to, you know, none of us. Well, I, mean, I know you have some background in, in programming, right? But um, him and I, like, we, we don't at all. And even when you're really advanced, it's uh, it, it, it's just amazing that, like, your knowledge can keep going and going. And once objects themselves, and I know classes are also just a further usage of objects, are so powerful. Once you start understanding, you know, how to use them, it's just, uh, you're okay. yeah, exactly. And that's what I said in the, the webinar yesterday. Look, understanding what we're covering here is quote unquote simple, right? It's just very basic. But how you apply it over time will completely change how you program. So let me let me show you one of the frustrating things that I, because, because I do a lot of um, writing in object notation, like the dot notation and everything like that, usually what I'll end up have, having is like, um, GUI one then has some other object like handles and handles is an array that has maybe, maybe it has like some other thing, other keys, blah, blah, blah. And then it's blah, blah, blah. Right. So I end up with these objects, these long, long, long strings. Well, a little trick that you can do is when you, when you say that, if I was to say, let me give, let me set up an example. If I was to set this up, now Bob equals whatever value this has. So it Bob equals two, two, two. If 
if I instead do this, Bob now equals basically the same object as this, a pointer to the same object. If I was to go and now change object, and then pop up a message for what Bob e Bob dot x equals, it's the same thing. So Bob Bob and object are both pointing at the same object. If either of them changes anything, both it affects for both of them. So if you call, let's say you call up a function. Well, for one, if you're passing something to the function, let's say I want to pass uh, a parameter to the function. You don't have to pass it the whole object all the time. You can pass it just down to the path that I, you want. So if I have like um, object dot uh, in one dot in two dot in three dot x, and I only I want to know what that x is when I call when I pass it a function, I can just pass it this, and it's just going to give me that that let's say that that was the two two two, it'll give me the two two two. In but let's say that this in three is an object that has multiple keys. Then when I call up the function, I will pass it the object up till the, that point. And now whatever's whatever the receiving is, so To make things a little bit clearer, I'm going to put this here. But this isn't how you declare this. You don't declare it like this, unless those are all declared already. Okay. But just for the sake of argument, okay. So if I call up the function and I pass it up to this three here, what it's going to do is it's going to pass it an object with an x and a y. So I can look at, in order to look at this dot x, if I want to look at that inside of the function, all I have to do is look at object dot x. Yeah, I get you. Right. Right. Likewise, if I want to look at in dot two, now if I want to, I can do in three dot x. So whatever whatever point makes the most sense to pass the object to. If I make any change, the other benefit of doing the object things is I don't need to return anything because any changes I make on this object, mm -hmm. it's going to make changes to the memory. Right. It's up to. Yeah, I get you. Right. So there's no need there's no need to return anything in this case. Or if if I have a case where I have to return multiple things, one of them can be just into my object, the other Oh, I yeah. Yeah, I in Python um I I first learned about tuples and using objects in a, in inside a function because you could only it like auto hockey you could return one thing, but then you you could return a tuple which is just a it's like an object you can't alter, you know, that's it's static. But it it once I learned that and then in auto hockey like it suddenly I'm like oh my god yeah returning an object instead of dealing with uh, uh, hrefs or whatever you know it's like so much easier uh, to deal with when you have a lot of data. There's okay so this is a little bit off topic but it's 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 mind blowing that you can actually do this. So if you return let's say you return an array or an object you can specify which which key you want to return. So and likewise like. If I was to do something like uh, if I was to do this, it's going to return me a f. SDF. I can actually specify which which one I want. So if I don't have this, out becomes an array. 
Well, and can't you use the dot? Can't you use a dot three there? Yeah, I think so too. Uh, you can probably too. On star split, I know you can. Just I haven't yeah. done it on substance, yeah. but I assume you can. It's, yeah. It's, it's most of the time that the the issue with the this here is if you're using like a uh, literal strings. Like if I if I need if it's a key that I need, let's say it's a, it's an array, for example, then then I can't do dot notation unless that dot equals. Oh, I, yeah, I understand your your point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's it's the same reason why it's the same reason why this isn't dot. It's not okay. it's not control dot. Yeah, because you might have some characters in there that won't allow for. Yeah. Um, the one thing I'd like to point out, though, which it doesn't matter, and I know you're just playing around, right? Yeah. But at the beginning here of 20, well, not the beginning, but the 23, you have percent out colon equals. What I love about what you're doing here, like, let's say you didn't actually need to store it. You just wanted to you you needed to grab that value. You don't have to put it in out. Yeah, you can just use you don't, even, you yeah. don't even have to do this. You That's don't even have saying. to do this. Right. Yeah. You, that could be inside your function. You never even store it. You just access what you need, and it's just a great shortcut to to get what you want. That which is why I, I once I started learning that about functions, I'm like, oh, mama, you know. And in fact, that's actually what I do, like with my my own drawing stuff. So if I do let's see this. So this, so this example, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of this because this is our second copy. But this was where I got the bitmap to an image off my, uh, from my, my uh, computer. Um, what I normally, what I develop this mainly for is to be able to do dynamic stuff, and I, for that I use GDIP drawing functions. So this is just a bunch of, all it is is, it. In order to draw something on the screen, I need to first create a brush or a pen. And then I need to use that to draw a shape, and then I need to delete that brush. So this code, that's all that this does. And I can use that in here without needing to create that variable. I can pass it that, and let me get my new dimensions, 300 and 450. Because before we were getting it from the image, now I don't have that image. Yeah. Okay. So there, now we have this. So in here, I didn't even need to create a. This returns a pointer to a bitmap, but I didn't need to. I didn't need to store it in a variable, because as soon as I'm done with it, I'm gonna actually right. just close yeah. it. Which, which is, yeah, and we talked about it. You know, on hockey is pretty good about cleaning up itself anyway. But, well, this in this case, in this case, you would definitely need to like for this specific thing, you would need to clean up because, in other words, you're going to have let's say let's say that this image on its own is about 200 kilobytes. Every single time it draws it, it's going to draw it, create 200 kilobytes, 200 kilobytes. And if it's if it's animating as I move across it, it might update 10 times a second, 20 times a second, and before I know it, I got 10 gigabytes. Well, I was referring to more of just because you're going to restart the script, but but anyway, that's a good, very good point. Um, I wasn't, I don't work with GUIs really, so I, I. Well, this is this is a GDIP thing specifically. So, in the, that's one thing you have to watch is if you create a bitmap data to bitmap, you have to dispose of it. Um, if you create a brush, you need to dispose of it because it's all just pointers, pointers to a, an address and memory. And deleting that that pointer isn't deleting the act the the stuff in the memory. It's just deleting the reference, so you you can't yes. pull it up, but it's still holding it. Yeah, and, and your computer doesn't know it can repurpose that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. exactly, exactly. Awesome. Well, let's uh, I, unless you have anything more you want. Yeah, to I, I just want to do one last thing where we animate something. So let's look at animating something, and to do that. I'm going to start from scratch. Well, not from scratch, but from not having anything except for that and that. 
okay, so I start a script and I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to make a circle move from one side of my screen to the other side of my screen. So I'm going to get some code. So this is, this, all this does is allows me to visually see what the code is, does. So you can write the code and it, you'll get the same result, but I'd rather have a visual thing. So I'm going to create a bitmap. I'm going to make it, actually, I'm going to make it with 1,200. So now I have a, a blank canvas that I'm going to draw something to. I'm going to fill a circle. And now I'm going to save this as, oh, this isn't my normal one. Um, Hey, it's weird, but now I hear the beeps. I didn't hear them earlier. That's weird. That's weird. Um, okay, so this now, if I was to create that GUI, that's what this will give me. So I'm going to run the script. I'm going to press number pad three to bring up my helper. I'm going to create a new window. I am going to show my window. I'm going to update my window. And I'm going to draw a bitmap to my window. Okay. Now I can go through um, 1,200, 200, zero. This is where I'm positioning the picture within this, the window. Bitmap is this. And if I run, I get a circle. Cool. So that's that's how little it takes to get an image on the screen, right? And if I have if I have the code to get an image from a file, it's just you can add that function in if that's what you do. But I share my code, so that means no downloads. If I share my code with somebody, it doesn't have anything you have to download. So no PNGs, no sound files. It's all text. Everything's text, copy paste. Yeah, which is pretty. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's what this is for. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, I don't know, create uh, a routine. So before my exit, set a timer. And I'm going to call it watch cursor. And I'll set it to go about 30 frames per second. And in here, if my script is, I'll run the script, number pad three. In here, I need to clear the window, draw a bitmap. Actually, I'll just copy this and update the window. And I'm going to create an object to do, to represent this guy. So I'm going to call it, it doesn't really matter what I call it. I'll just call it Bob, just to say, you know, this is something that doesn't really matter what I call it. Uh, okay, I'll just give it an X key. And I'm going to pass it. Um, Actually, I guess I'm going to keep it happy. Uh, yeah. I have to pass it. I have to pass it an object. Uh, I'm going to change this to be, I would, yeah, obj.x. So my x, my object only has one key. It just has an x key. But if I had, a, I could do width, height, whatever I want. Likewise with like color, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so actually, let me do that. Let me do that. So I'm going to say if, uh, if, so I have, this is called a ternary statement. So Joe, you're, you're probably familiar with this, but this is just basically an if statement that I can do in one line. Yeah, I, 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 love I have my own, I have my own. Say that again. You might, you muted a little bit off. I said I love them. Um, you, you have your own what? Oh, you're frozen. 
Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you again. Okay. I said I love them, but you, you said you have your own something. What were you? Yeah, I have I have my own syntax. So most people, the way I'll see them do it is they'll like have like var colon equals, and then they'll have their their statement, right? I don't do it that way, and the reason why is because often um, I have multiple. I need to assign multiple things to the same thing. So it's not just var equals this. It's also Bob also equals something, and and Sam equals something, and var six equals something. So in order to do that, I don't use this this same syntax. So mine always starts off with the statement first. So I'm saying uh, if object dot uh, color. If object color, I'm going to just use a true or false. So if object color is a one or a zero, zero, that's all it states it's going to be. So if it's a one, I'm going to make the color. So that's my statement. If, it, if that has a value. Then I want to draw this color. In other words, I want to draw this color. Um, yeah, I said that I was going to talk about the color. The color is hexadecimal, so the, the first two digits represent that it's a hexadecimal number. The, then it's followed by eight more digits. These are broken up into pairs. The first two digits are the alpha. It's in hexadecimal or base 16. And this this number down oh sorry this number up here is the hexadecimal number of this decimal number so if i look ff is 255 69 in hex is 105 and likewise so let's say ff is 255 so if i say ff it means full full value full it's fully opaque if I had zero, zero, it's fully transparent. The next two digits are the red value. So these two numbers. Next two numbers are the green value. These two numbers. And then this, the, the blue value. So that's, that's this. That's what this is. Zero X, it's a hex number. FF for full alpha. Or no alpha, no alpha I guess. Full Opacity, opacity, and uh, what color should I do? Let's do red. FF0000. So if I was to do FF00 is this color. Um, so up here. Let me separate some things. So I've drawn my, my graphics to the window, and now I want to animate it. So in here, I'm going to take those things and just do some simple stuff with it. I'm not going to program it to like loop back or anything like that. Okay, so what I've said is every single time it loops, so it's going to loop this approximately 30 times per second. Uh, I'm going to say, okay, go ahead, take the position of the ball and move it one pixel over. If the pick, if the position of the ball is greater than 500, approximately if it's gone past 500 halfway, go ahead and change uh, the value of color to one, so that way we can get a, a different color going. And then I'm going to pass it, Bob. I get it. Yeah. So that is there. I made the switch. Did you see? Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. This is animated. Wow. Clear, clear the window, draw what you want to the window, and then update it so you can see it. And so the line 30 is what's incrementing? 
But moving line up? 30, yes, line 30 is taking that object X, uh, Bob X, and it starts off at a value of 300, so let's change that to like 100. And now it starts over there. And if I want it to go faster. Uh, okay, change the step. Yeah. Cool. Very cool, man. That is much easier than I would have expected. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just all this stuff here. So if you want to have composite I images, like if I want to do, let's say, You know, it's funny, it hadn't dawned on me, but I'm using OBS where I'm adding lower thirds at the beginning to have it pop up with, like, my name and the automator. Um, I could easily do that with AutoHotKey and have it pretty, you know, um, and just have it embedded in the video itself. Oh, cool. Um, Did I delete my stuff? I guess I did. Is it in the other script? No, no, no. Uh, let, me, let me go back. Let me, I think I deleted stuff that I didn't want to delete. I, I guess I want to give you this, this code after. Okay. So what I was going to do is just copy this and put in another. I can duplicate it again um, just by giving it, uh, let's say... So, yeah, any, any kind of things you want. Um, so that's pretty much that's pretty much the class. Uh, let me go over. There is one thing. Okay. So if you want, if you have a window that needs to change sizes, so sometimes it's necessary. Let's say for this, for example, like if you want this kind of effect, but on like an actual where you need to actually change the size of the window to accommodate a new graphics or something like that. If you're shrinking the window down, no problem. But if you expanding it out, once you create that window, it creates its own bitmap or its own like layer that you can draw to. And if you want to make the window bigger after you've created it, I've made it made it really easy by being able to call up um, by calling up this set windows properties. So if you let's say um, I have a hotkey. Let's say in here what I want it to do when I press number pad five, I want it to put a new image up on my screen, but maybe this image is five times as big as the image that I had before. What I do is I like that process that I did before where I get the image from the, the file and then I get the width and height. Now I have a width and height. If I go in here, and do set windows properties. If I change these values here, I also need to change one other thing. So there's something hidden here that if I pass it a value of one, it destroys those graphics uh -huh. and recreates them. At, so that way, you X, Y, or sorry, the width and height that you're. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's say let's say before my window was width was twelve. I, maybe I still have twelve hundred, but maybe the new height is like four hundred. If I don't know, 600. If it's if it's 600, if I don't do this update, then it's not gonna. It's I'm only still gonna have a window that's 400 pixels tall. Got it. So this this is built into the class, so you can do this. And if you look at the class, it's just basically calls up those functions. So this is how it creates those those graphics objects. 
that are, have to do with the GDIP stuff. It's not really important. Like, what is a dip section? What is a dip section? What is a compatible DC? Right? So, yeah, we don't really, these are one of the cases where if you want to, I suggest you go and dig deeper, but you don't have to know it to, to use it. Right? I don't know what a dip section is. I don't know what a, I don't know what a compatible DC is. Right. Um, and, you know, DC stands for device context. And you think that a word that has the word context in it would have more context. But uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it just if you call up this set windows properties, if you give it this value of one here, it just deletes those things and recreates them. So that's that's all that does. So if you need to change the size of the window, make sure you call call up set window properties. Likewise, if. You, we, a bunch of the examples we had, we had where we can click on the window and drag it to move it. What we need to do, this class doesn't keep track of that. And in, in fact, if you, if you update the window, it uses your values. It uses your X, Y width and height. So if you, if you drag it and then update the window, it's going to go back to where it was. Yeah, so you need to update it. Yeah. You have to you have to call up that set window properties yeah. and just give it an X in the home. Cool. Right. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that covers everything. I think cool. that's pretty right. much it. Uh, yeah. Wait, let me let me wait. Set window properties. Show window. Hide window is just GUI hide. Uh, update layered window. That's how you draw the graphics. So when you draw stuff, you're drawing on the graphics layer, and in order for it to go onto the screen, you have to update it. Uh, clear windows clears the graphics. So when it counters this, if I had no other code, this does nothing. Clear window does nothing until you update. Okay. Um, draw bitmap and paint background and delete window. Delete window is the last one. So if I'm done with this window, I can call up, call up this, call up delete, delete window. And it does all the cleanup for me. So I have that window, and if I hit number five, no, wrong, wrong one, number pad five. Let me do that again. If I hit number pad five, it deletes the window. And if I was to run that window over and over and over and over again, and if I was to bring up the task manager, I can confirm that it is deleting all the memory. Actually, to do one last thing, what you want to do is this gives you an empty, an object that still has all those keys, but they're empty. So to finish it off, you can just do this. Because in other words, you have GUI one. It still has an X key. Doesn't have a value. I think that's how it works. I think that's how it works. Yeah. Um, amazing. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you, man. That was a great intro. No problem. No problem. I'll, um, Thank you for. I'll 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 have a link at the beginning of the video um, to where to get the these two files and your pop-up window and in the GDI library in case people don't know where to get that. Um, I've been using, I've been using this library um, since April. So I wrote this library in April and I've been using it quite a bit in on the forum in the ask for help. So if anyone wants to see more examples of using the class, go to the forum, type in pop-up window and you should get a million results. Excellent. Thanks, man. Yeah, thank you. Good talking to you.